Camp Followers, um, we're back where we have um, Dr. Katie Frill Russell with us again. We are so lucky to have this lady with us. We're talking about topics that feature regularly in first opinion practice and quite often hard for owners to get their heads around. So they're going to be quite challenging topics and they're probably going to be things that owners don't really want to hear but they're important and they're very important in chronic pain management and arthritis is one of the leading causes of chronic pain. We've just done an episode about um, ball throwing and how we can modify our, beha our behavior with the ball and have potentially even better um, results with regards to our dog's contentment and happiness. We're now going to talk about the emotional impact of ball, repetitive ball throwing just to kind of seal the deal and open people's eyes to this regular activity that is seen all across the globe. So Katie, take it away. So yeah, absolutely. It is seen everywhere. Most people think that that is kind of a normal thing that you should do on your dog walk. You go out, you go to a field, you throw a ball, you go home. But for a dog, that is, you couldn't be further from normal. It's such an abnormal behavior for a dog to just keep practicing that over and over again. And a lot of the dogs that um, this is happening with, people will regularly use the word obsessed. You know, they're obsessed with the ball. They, um, you know, they can't eat if there's a ball on display. They, as soon as I let them off the lead, they just won't stop looking at me or barking at me or jumping up at me until I get the ball out. So these are dogs that literally cannot do a normal behavior because of the ball. If, if that was a human, we would be saying there was some major addiction issues going on there. You know, you, if yeah. you couldn't like anything so much that you can't eat and you can't sleep and you can't walk and you can't interact with anybody without that being an issue. Do you know what? That's so interesting that you said that because um, I guess I am getting renowned for being quite blunt and outrageous, but I do say to my owners, if your son came and stared at you with wide eyes, a grimace, moving from side to side, looking at your handbag, waiting for you to get the wallet out so they can go and buy what they need. You would be really quite worried about it. Yeah, absolutely. It wouldn't be a behaviour that you would want to encourage or accept as normal and you'd challenge it because it would be a sign of misery and frustration and concern. But for some reason, I think we've got slightly confused with what dogs are actually doing yeah absolutely and especially it's not just out in the field i mean there are, i regularly see people who particularly with collies and it is in lots of breeds but it, we do see it a lot in collies because not necessarily because of the dogs but because of this perception that everyone has that collies are obsessed with balls and also need excessive amounts of exercise every day and they will play fetch in the house for hours and hours every day I mean, I don't know how the people cope with it because I certainly wouldn't and the dogs really don't either. And it, what they actually want the dog to be doing is to be relaxing like a normal dog would. Yeah. But they accidentally teach these dogs to just never stop and to just keep going after the ball and after the ball and after the ball and after the ball. And that's not a nice behavior for the dog to be doing in the same way. If it was a, like you say, if it was a, a human doing that, if that was your child, you'd be getting really quite concerned that you'd be saying, well, shouldn't you be doing some things that most people would do or relaxing, being happy and content and confident and relaxed does not go hand in hand with being obsessed with something to that degree. And so that's yeah. not what people want their dogs to be doing really, but they think it's what the dog needs. And I think also you highlight two things that I, I in my role as a vet for the last 20 years, I've seen a lot of, is that there's a misunderstanding where owners like to see their dogs being active and engaging and alert and energetic and, you know, a real manifestation of a, a, a really fit, agile dog. Look at him. He looks, he's on peak form. But also they want 
to have a dog that's content and calm and be able to switch off and yeah. and, and go to their bed and relax. And that's quite a, re- well, I'm not going to say ridiculous because that's rude, but that's an incredible achievement to go from extremely, you know, alert to immediately calm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we find it hard. How many times have you been desperate to fall asleep and you still, your brain's whirring through all of the stuff that's been happening and we can't just switch off like that. And yet not a lot of people expect their dogs to, but yeah. not only do they expect their dogs to, lots of people have the misconception, which we see all the time, that physical exercise will fix a behavioral problem. Yeah. So they think if I exercise a dog an extra hour, then I'm going to get that calm behavior at home. Yeah. And if you do that every now and then, so say you said, I, I, I'm suddenly working from home and I need to do an important uh, online chat with somebody and I need the dog to be quiet. If you weren't in any kind of lockdown or anything like that, and you went out and you did a, a really long walk all morning and you came home, yet your dog might just be so tired they don't move for the day but that's not sustainable because if you just kept that level of exercise up you and your dog are going to get fitter and you'll no longer have that result so you just have to do more and more exercise to get them to be calm because they're just absolutely wiped out so it's 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 a rubbish way of managing behavior yeah and i do you know what i've found um With Luna, now I'm in quite a lucky position in that Luna arrived when Holly was on a downturn and therefore Luna didn't get our full attention. So she wasn't a spoiled kind of minx puppy. She she kind of had her place. She was just a fraction of the household, not the whole household. And she also had limited kind of interaction and exercise in games because a lot of attention was focused on Holly and she's resulted into quite a calm dog um but what I have noticed with her border collie that's not very common for them to be calm but what <laughs> I is that when I come back from a walk with her we have at least 15 to 20 minutes where she doesn't calm down she's still buzzing she's still all of the juices flowing in the brain and um, it takes a while for those to simmer down. Now, the reason that this podcast is in the podcast audio is important to Cam is that I strongly believe that if we start gaining a better understanding about dog behavior, we will then be able to understand those first indications of pain. We'll understand those indications of actually significant pain. And we'll be able to challenge the disease by intervening quicker and more thoroughly. And I believe that behavior really is a key to us doing this. So I'm hoping that you guys are finding these audios helpful and you can start looking at your relationship with your dog um, and just challenge yourself what you think is normal um, because they are integral or a successful management plan do you agree oh absolutely yeah we we need to be able to understand dogs if we're wanting to to interact with them successfully uh, you know it, it, a huge amount of the problems we see are from miscommunication so from just not understanding what our dogs are saying whether that's pain or anxiety or too much of any kind of stimulation yeah yeah, definitely. So we're going to leave it here today. And we're going to come back. And when our next topic is going to be um, the more negative emotional states, but how they can overwhelm a presentation of pain and therefore make quite a confusing picture to interpret. So we're going to speak to you again tomorrow. Thank you so much, Katie. See no you. No problem. <laughs>